and uh, we'll read from verse 10 to verse 19. So this is Apostle Paul, the missionary, um, writing to one of the churches that he started in Philippi. He says this in verse 10, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your consent for me. You were indeed consent for me, but had no opportunity. Note that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstances, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you, Philippians, you yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no change entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the food that increases to your credit. I have received full payment, and more I have well supplied. Having, having received from does come from us the name, the gifts you sent, and its fragrance offering as a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches, glory, and Christ Jesus. Name of God and of Father, be glory forever. Amen. Amen. They say, let your actions speak louder than what your word. You see, a man of few words, but action speaks more volume. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Please help me welcome our general. I want to talk today about the faith that flourishes. Amen. Ah, let me say that again. I want to talk about the faith that flourishes. Amen. You plant the seed, and it is in the ground. We see nothing, but there's work taking place in the ground. A while later, we see this little sapling that comes up. It's a bit weak. It's a bit pathetic. There's nothing about it, but at least there's something there. Mm -hmm. But then before you know it, there's this blossoming, blooming flower. Mm -hmm. Glorious in this way, Jesus says that the lilies of the field would look better than anything that Solomon ever had. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that means? That means that the fields that you see are better than what any rich person can put together. Hallelujah. Amen. And who put it together? God put it together. Yes. And because one man can plant and another man can water, but it is God that will bring the increase. Amen. Amen. Yes. Ah, and when he brings the increase, it's not just good. It is very good. Yes. I don't take my word for it. You see in Genesis chapter 1 at the end, he looks at his work and he doesn't say it's good. No. He says it's very good. And so the faith that flourishes is a faith that works in you to reach to a stage where you can fulfill God's word in your life so that when he looks at you, he doesn't say good. He says very, very, very good. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Mm. Very good. But that faith mm. has to go through a process. Mm. It has to go through a process. And so I want to talk to us about some of the things that we can get about the faith that flourishes as long as you're prepared to go through the, through the process. As long as you're prepared. Uh, but I can't preach this without saying thank you, Lord, for the ground on which I preach. And by that, I don't mean this ground. Amen. Although I am grateful for the ground. I'm grateful because I could have been under the ground, couldn't I? And it could have been a situation that meant that I wasn't in. So, so I am grateful for this. But the ground that I'm talking about is about the build-up that has led to me being here. So the build up that's led me to being here, those of you who were here last week, and those of you who have a access to YouTube, you can catch up with it. And last week, uh, somebody even better than me in terms of her looks, 
I was here preaching the word. What did he have to say? So somebody here that was preaching, preached the word of God about faith. And she preached the word about faith because we're building on something. We started a February in faith because we had a January in the word of God. And there's something deliberate about the way that things are being built up because we have to understand we don't start, we respond. Yes. We don't start, we respond. God starts. Yes. And how does he start? He starts with his word. Hallelujah. He speaks, it comes to pass. Hallelujah. So if you don't have the word, there is no beginning. So there's something deliberate in saying that you have to start with the word of God. We don't start anything. Or sadly, whatever we start without the word will end in failure. Yes. Because a lot of us are starting things on our own, yeah. on our own backs, in our own strength, in our own mind, thinking we can do our own thing. But your Bible tells you time and time again, every time you start something on your own back, it will end in failure. Ah, yeah. oh, but your God didn't create you for failure. Ah, and the only way you can learn that is by walking by faith. So, God starts everything by his word. So, my wife preached last week on, on faith and elements of faith and what we need to know about faith. And then we had the month in the word of God where the highlight for me, although some would argue it's the only Sunday I was here, but the highlight for me in January was the word that Mama Jo spoke about the importance of the word of God. And I have to go back to Mama Jo because it was actually Mama Jo that's also a good platform for me to preach because last year there's a wonderful video that I really encourage you to watch where Mama Jo was talking about the importance of the one. And she highlighted that there's a problem that we have in that sometimes our question is about the what and the why, but it really should be about the who. Why should I do this? Or what should I do this for? Yeah. <laughs> I, I even enjoyed the direction. <laughs> 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 Just in case I didn't get the message. So, so, so Mama Jo preached about this, not about the what and the why, it's about the who. Yes. And then afterwards, uh, at some point, my captain also preached about the importance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love my captain, Kelvin Myers. I love him. I love him. And one of the reasons why I love him is because he's sold out for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We don't refer to him as an evangelist just to give people titles. Mm. You refer to people for who they are. Yes. When you look at that man in the back there, he is an evangelist. Amen. Everyone that comes out of him wants people to know there is a God. Gospels as well. It talks about a story where the disciples are on the boat, 
But Jesus has decided to go back and stay. And there's a storm, and the boat is rocking, but then they see somebody who's taking a stroll on the water. As you do. Huh? How many times has anyone seen a great storm taking place, and a gentleman just taking a stroll on the water? It's stormy, you know. It should be overwhelming, him, but he's just taking a stroll. Oh, this is your Jesus, you know. This is your Jesus. It's stormy. It's raging. But he's taking a stroll. And they see what appears to be a ghost. Uh, because we're not used to people walking on the water. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure the last time that you went to uh, Trenton Lakes and you saw me say, oh, I'll just I'll do the boat and I'll just take the boat. <laughs> I don't tend to see them. That's just my experience. I don't tend to see them. I just, but there they are. They think it's a ghost. But Peter says, hey, if that's really you, call me out to you. And the ghost says, yeah, come. And as long as Peter was looking at him, he was able to come out of the boat oh, yeah. and take one step and two step and three step. It was going so well. It was going so well. And the disciples, can you imagine the disciples saying, okay, Peter, but you do realize it's stormy, don't you? And Peter was like, oh, 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 yeah, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, and he begins to sing. Oh, 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 oh. He was doing so well. He was walking while Jesus was walking. He was walking to Jesus. They were walking to each other. It was going so well. And then, and then he remembered, uh oh, my circumstances say I shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> my friends are still in the boat. I'm the only one out here. My friends are in there. The storm is around me. You'll notice when his focus isn't on, his focus is no longer on the one that called him. That is why the faith that flourishes focuses on Jesus. Jesus does not call you out of circumstances. In fact, Jesus calls you into circumstances. The call of Jesus is not to a life free from pain, is it, sir? Huh? It's not from a life free from hassle and issues, as though everything in your life will go well. That's not your story, is it, sir? That's not your story, is it, Pastor? That's not your story, is it? It's not your story that Jesus called you and you came and everything went well. No issues in your marriage. Uh, no issues with your children. No issues with your finances. No issues. That's just, that's just plain. That is not the call of Christ. In fact, your word tells you that if you're called, expect persecution. If you're called, expect suffering. If you're called, expect these things, but also... Expect to overcome. Amen. Oh, expect to. Amen. Expect to Amen. overcome. Amen. Because the faith that flourishes focuses on Jesus. Amen. This same Jesus that encouraged Peter to come. And Peter sank, and Jesus picked him up and took him back to where he came from. This is the same Peter that Jesus had to look at uh, later on while they're having a meal. And he said, you know what, the devil wants to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you so that when you are restored, you can help your brothers. When your focus is on Jesus, you will recognize it really is Jesus doing the work. You're in the situation. You have the struggle. You have the panic. You have the pain. You have the situations going around. You are the one that has the bills to pay. You are the one that has the work issues. You are the one that has the exams. You are the one. Oh, but when your focus is on Jesus, he will remind you that because you belong to me, I am the one that will do the work. So that you can truly say, it is no longer I who live, but it is the Christ that lives in me. Amen. It is the Christ that lives in me that gets the bills paid. It is the Christ that's in me that allows me to navigate these relationship channels and challenges. It's the Christ in me that allows me to overcome. It's the Christ in me because I recognize that because my focus is on Jesus, it is him and him alone that enables me 
to overcome. I need him. Because the faith that flourishes focuses on Jesus. But the reality is Jesus is looking for the few who will remain faithful in a sea of faithlessness. We live in a sea of faithlessness. You ever dare tell anyone that you stand on the word of God, that you walk by faith, and you look at the range of faces that they will give you, and the range of responses that they will give you as well. From the sympathetic, oh, that must be good for you. Must be another. Oh, that must be good for you. That's all right. To the arrogant and the strongly and the rude people who tell you, your faith makes no sense. This is the 21st century. You believe in a book that was written thousands of years ago. We've moved on since then. We've progressed. We're better people. What kind of nonsense are you believing in? A sea of faithlessness. The writer to the Hebrews was writing to a people who were surrounded in a sea of faithlessness. And the faithlessness hurt them. Because now they had their properties confiscated. Because now they had people who were taken from them. Because now their jobs that they relied on were being taken away from them because of their faith. There were Jews who could survive, but they couldn't survive because of their faith. And so they began to wonder, hold on a minute. Is it really worth it? I'm suffering, but they're all right. Is it, is it really worth it? I mean, we, we, we believe in God anyway. And we can say we believe in God. Do I really have to, do I really have to take this extra step? Is it really worth it to suffer while other people are doing well? So I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, from verse 32. This particular version says, Recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while and the coming one will come and will not delay but my righteous one shall live by faith and if he shrinks back my soul has no pleasure in him ah but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. You live in a sea of faithlessness. You know that. And the really troubling thing is, the sea of faithfulness sometimes influences the church itself. Sometimes influences and sometimes pours into the church itself. Sometimes there are people who are only too aware of the way of the world and the way that the world is going and the pressure that it puts. So we don't want to upset anyone, apparently. Mm. And we don't want to offend anyone, apparently. And we don't want to cause anyone any distress. So what we've got to do is we've got to relax our standards mm. so that we can be more accommodating. We've got to relax our standards so that we can be more inclusive. We've got to relax our standards so that other people can have, a, can, can have a part of what we have. When actually what we're saying is, we don't want to offend you, so we'll do what it takes to allow you to be a part of us, even if it costs us who we are. A sea of faithlessness. Ah, but this writer in Hebrews is saying, listen, you know where you're coming from. You know where your faith is built on. And this is what he says, he who has promised the coming one will come. And he will come with a reward. And the righteous will live by faith. But hold on, if you shrink back, if you 
say to yourself, it's too hard. If you say to yourself, I want to compromise because it would be easier if I compromised. If you say to yourself, I want to compromise because I won't get as much hassle if I compromise. If you say that, and you continue to say that, your word is telling you, you will receive something else. There is a reward, and then there's a response of God that says, I have no pleasure with him. Imagine God saying that to you, I have no pleasure with you. Imagine. Imagine after all he's done for you, after all he's given you, after everything he is doing through you, you were to turn around and live in such a way that he would turn around to, to you and say, I have no pleasure with you. But this morning, I'm encouraging us all to take on the encouragement that the writer in Hebrews is telling us to have faith. Yes. Oh, and not any ordinary faith, not a flimsy faith that is here today and gone tomorrow. A faith that endures. Some of you are sitting here because you know what it is to have the faith that endures. Some of you are sitting here having gone through very tough trials. Trials that would have knocked other people out, but the mercies of God has allowed you to stay where you are. And you're holding on, but some of you are loosening your grip. Some of you are feeling the tension, and you're loosening your grip. Like Peter, you're hearing the noises, and you're seeing the sea around you, and you're beginning to lose focus. But I'm here to tell you that when you focus on Jesus, and when you hold on to him, he will give you the power to overcome. Amen. I'm encouraging you, have faith. Amen. Have faith in Jesus. Amen. Do not have faith in Jesus for, have faith in Jesus. Amen. Amen. That is to say, don't have faith in Jesus for your husband. Have faith in Jesus for Jesus. Amen. And Jesus will sort you out. Amen. Don't have faith in Jesus for your exams. Because here's what tends to happen. They will be like the children of Israel. And the book of Hebrews was written to people to remind them. You'll recall that God took them out of Egypt. But that generation didn't go into the promised land because of faithlessness. Because what? They would be hungry and thirsty. They would moan. They would be fed. And the next week they would be complaining and moaning again. They would be told by the God that took them out that you're going in. And then they'd say, well, we're not going in. The faithful God had faithlessness responded to him. And he said, I have no pleasure in you. So none of you are going in except the two. Because those two had my kind of faith. Yes. They had a faith that says that God is, and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Their focus was on God. So that when the circumstances said, you see that city over there, it's full of people who are huge and big and mighty, and they drive cars, and they have houses, and they, and they even have Netflix. How can we possibly? And those two men said, listen, if our God said that we can do it, we can do it. Uh -huh. I'm talking to an audience of people who know, because you are minorities in a majority country. Yes. And the majority are telling you, conform to the majority. Mm. You can't survive unless you conform to the majority. You won't get far unless you conform to the majority, but your word tells you do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Hallelujah. And what helps you to be transformed is that focus on Jesus. Yes. That focus on Jesus for who he is, not for who you want him to be. I'm probably saying more for me than for you, but a focus on Jesus for who he is, not who you want him to be. And you recall that when the people of Israel saw that Moses had been in the mountain for a while, they said to themselves, this Moses guy, he's a bit of a joke, but he's not coming back, is he? Yeah. And if he's not coming back, what are we going to do for God? I'll tell you what we'll do for God. We will make God. Yeah. 
<laughs> because after all, if we've lost God, we want to make God. And you're better to make God than us. So we'll make God. That's what the people of Israel did. When, when they didn't see a God that would please them, they made a God that was pleasing to them. But your Bible says that those who make things and worship the things are as worthless as the things that they worship. Mm -hmm. So the God that created you to be functioning and flourishing and full, you are pathetic because you're worshipping a TV. Mm -hmm. You're worshipping a mobile phone. Uh, preach. Mm -hmm. You're worshipping sports. Ah. You're worshipping money. You're worshipping cars. You're hey. worshipping... Faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler 